your Bibles with you, be finding Matthew chapter 5. We'll begin today in verse 27 and go through verse 30 as we are looking at the six tests of true Christianity. We saw uh, last Sunday on anger, verses 21 to 26. And if you miss that one, you can get that online, or I believe it's on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. So if you want to catch up. Uh, so the first test was in the area of anger. Today we're looking at the issue of uh, lust, sexual passions. And I want to stay as close to the text as I can. These are the words of Jesus. Uh, the topic, of course, is a bit delicate, as you can imagine, so we will need to follow what Jesus is saying carefully. Let's begin by reading Matthew 5, 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now that's not an unimportant phrase. It's in his heart. It's, the consequences are different in life than in the heart. If you, you may covet a lot of money and have an obsession about it, and that's one thing, it's in your heart, but it's a whole different ball game if you go rob a bank to get it. Uh, consequences are different. So when he says whoever looks with, to, to lust after has committed adultery in his heart. In other words, God knows but the justice system does not. Then, verse 29, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members, then your whole body go into hell. Yikes. So we'll look at four things. The command, thou shalt not commit adultery. The true meaning of it, the deeper meaning of it, if you, he said if you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Then third, we'll look at the dramatic solution. Pluck out the eye, cut off the hand. And finally, fourth, we will look at Jesus' solemn warning. It's better to do that than go to hell. So first, let's look at the command very quickly. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now here he quotes from the Ten Commandments. I believe this is the seventh commandment uh, given in Exodus chapter 20 to the Jews right after they came out of Egyptian bondage. God gave them these Ten Commandments... Moses said in Deuteronomy 4.40, he said, Keep these statutes and commandments commanded to you today, so it will go well with you and your children. God gave the Ten Commandments not to restrict your fun, but so it would go well with you and your children. The Ten Commandments are an expression of the very love of God. 
Then the true meaning of this commandment, verse 28, Jesus said, But I say to you, everyone who even looks at a woman to lust has committed adultery in his heart. That's, that is Jesus bringing out the true intent of the law. In other words, the law is not, it says you can't commit adultery. But that includes, you can't subscribe to Playboy channels or get it in the, in the mailbox. I don't, know if you can get, I don't know if you can get magazine, Playboy magazines now. Who knows? Anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see several of those hands. Now, we can soften it just a little. Um, If you'll look in uh, verse 28, everyone who looks at a woman, that verb in Greek is a continual tense. It means you're continually gazing. It's not that you have looked at a woman and admired her beauty. And then you move on. You can admire a woman's beauty or a man's without obsessing and staring rather embarrassingly. The true meaning is the law forbids not only the act but the root of that act. Psalm 119, verse 96, Your commandment, David said, is exceeding broad. It's a lot broader than you think. The NIV puts it, Your commands are boundless. They get to the heart of the matter in every direction. Then third, the dramatic solution to the issue of lust. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. He has been teaching through this passage that true Christianity is inward. It's a matter of the heart. True Christianity is not religious observances, simply liturgies and rituals. True Christianity is when the sinner has been changed, remade by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that there are some things that are not sins in and of themselves. Notice how he puts that. If your right eye causes you to sin, it's not a sin. There are some things you can do, it's not a sin. But it causes you to sin. And Jesus says, don't do the things that trigger, that pull the trigger on the sins that you fight and struggle with all the time. It says, it may be as dear to you as your right eye or right hand. Obviously here, Jesus is not being literal. He's not saying you literally should pluck out an eye or cut off a hand. Uh, If if plucking out an eye could uh, keep you from lusting in your heart, pluck out one eye and then you'd still lust with the other eye. Pluck that one out, and now you still got lust in your heart. Now you're blind and sinful. So Paul, the way Paul put it, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. It's, we don't, in other words, Jesus is saying, don't take chances with this. Run, run from it. Sexual sin 
causes such devastation, has the potential for such ruin that Jesus says, don't take a chance. Be extra precautious. When when I was growing up, Billy Graham made it a point to never be alone with a woman in a car. And a lot of people laughed at that and scorned it, but Billy Graham knew his own life. He knew his own weaknesses. He knew his own limits. And you have to know, you have to know that, that it, it may be dramatic in order to escape the living in lust. But Jesus says, this thing is so much a part of you that you need to get dramatic about it in order to be free. Normal won't win this battle. One young man in the seminary where I attended back in in Texas years ago, his wife was discovered to have been unfaithful to him, and he was preparing for the ministry. He withdrew from the seminary, put his life on hold, put his ministry on hold, put his education on hold, and just took his wife, and they moved back home. That was drastic. But I think that was the right decision. See, this thing is so subtle. It's like your right eye and right hand. If it feels so good, it can't be wrong. It must be right. There's a man in the Old Testament who just sort of went with the moment. He viewed promiscuity as normal. His name was Samson. Sexual purity to him was no big deal. And in Judges 16, verse 4, it says that Samson loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Y'all know her. I mean, you know about her. She was a Philistine prostitute. And one day I was reading that, and I was just checked that word loved, Ahab, or Ahab, is actually the Hebrew word. He loved a woman named Delilah. This word Ahab, or Ahab, can refer to a parent's love for children, like Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 22, verse 2. Uh, Abraham loved Isaac, his son. It may refer to a husband's love for his wife, Isaac and Rebekah, in Genesis 24, 67. Rebekah became his wife, and he loved her. Ahav, Ahab. It may refer even to your love for God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Shema. Every Jew quotes this first thing in the morning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and thou shalt love Ahav, the Lord thy God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They quote that every morning. That's the Jewish duty. And he uses the same word, to love your children, to love your wife, to love your God, as it used when it says Samson loved this Philistine harlot. Which leads me to say this. You can love someone that you should not marry. A man some years ago, a long time ago, actually this back when I, almost when I first came, he, he came, his, his family asked him to come and see the pastor of the church. 
because they attended off and on. And he had had an affair with a lady across the street from their house. And he told me, he said, um, well, I think I asked him, do you love your, your wife? And, and he said, yes, I do. And he said, I also love this other woman. And he said, I'm telling you, I love her. I love her from the depths of my soul. I love her. Now the question is, <clears throat> do you think that I should counsel him, leave your wife and marry her? No. The only counsel I could give him is you have to stop loving her. <laughs> what would you say? No, go ahead. Because you're in love. You can love someone that you should not marry. And unless that love is within the biblical boundaries of the marriage covenant, it is a forbidden love. And if, you, if you've watched Samson's life, he loved her. He really loved her like, he, like you would love a wife, like you would love your children, like you would love God. He loved Delilah. And he ended up being betrayed by her, sold down the river by her. The Philistines captured him, put out his eyes, and set him to grinding corn in the, in the temple of their god Dagon. So God says, watch who you love. And if you're loving the wrong one, stop doing it. Even if it's as close as the right hand or your right eye, if it's that painful, cut the hand off, pluck the eye out, but get it done because your future counts on it. Now, of course, the best thing here is that you not fall in love with somebody like that. Watch out who you fall in love with. Don't get emotionally close to a forbidden relationship that you know doesn't have a future in the kingdom of God. Okay, how are we doing so far? You can, you can truly love somebody. See, if, if they say, but I, I love them. Don't say, no, you don't. That's just puppy love. That's just lust. Don't say that. Because you can truly love somebody that you should not marry. But here's the flip side. You can be married to someone that you don't love. Maybe you don't like the way he eats, or snores, or drives, or combs his hair, or the way they brush their teeth. Oh my goodness. I, my, my precious wife, whom I love most of the time, has this thing. She has an electric toothbrush. So I'm sitting, this is at night just before bed, I'm usually sitting in the chair watching the news, and she cranks up the electric toothbrush. And I, I, it's like a chainsaw just started. And she walks around the house, and she'll come over and be right over the top of me. <laughs> What's the weather? I'm like, give me a break, woman. That's, that's just part of living within a covenant for 45 years. You, <laughs> you, there are times when you love them. There are times when the emotional flame dies down and the romance is kind of on the down low. Then there's times when it flames up again. And I just want to add, 
I'm in one of those times. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The older women are to teach the younger women what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and their children. To train the young women to love their husbands. See, older women can do that. We, you've been through all that. You know the ups and downs. You know the vicissitudes. So what do you do? You, you can take these young women and say, I know you're going through that, but you, give it another week, give it another month, give it another year, give it another decade, because you're in a covenant. Therein abide with God. Let God complete you. Don't put all your eggs in a man's basket. And by the way, ladies, don't look to a man to make you happy. A man can very well be the source of your greatest misery. <laughs> Let God make you happy. Let Him be the source of your happiness, and that way you'll never be in an unhappy marriage. Hallelujah! Amen. Come on, baby! Come on! Amen. How to never have an unhappy marriage? Be happy in God and with Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Mm. So if you say, I just don't love them anymore, I would say, all right, nothing's impossible with God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, that love for that person can be regained and renewed and revived, and you can love them again. And it will be a sweeter, deeper love than it would be if you go find someone else that you are temporarily in love with again. Don't let Hollywood come in and give you its philosophy. Because their, their question whenever, you know, you have a, 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 a spouse who's thinking about getting a divorce and they're talking to a friend and the friend will always say something like this, well, do you love them? Are you in love with them? Nah. You can be married to someone that you don't love because you can love them again. Even Jesus said, take it from him who's the embodiment of truth. There are some relationships that are like as close and intimate as the eye and the right hand, and you'll have to cut it off, pluck it out. Now, number four, a solemn warning. Here is the elephant in the room. It is better for you, verse 29, to lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. Same thing in verse 30. It's better to lose one of your members and your whole body go into hell. He mentions hell twice. He also mentioned it, the lake the, the fires of hell up in verse 22. Jesus talks about hell three times here in a, dozen, in a dozen verses. Hell. And he issues here a solemn warning. He seems to be saying, this is my understanding of it, that you need to deal with this because it's better to lose something that's part of you than to lose all of you for eternity. I mean, it, you're looking at the price that you would have to pay to deal with sexual passion, but you need to look at the price you will pay if you don't deal with it. The alternatives or do it, or go to hell. Seems to be the path Jesus is making for us. 
Only I, uh, Jesus is your primary preacher and teacher about the subject of hell in the four Gospels. And I would never bring this up if he hadn't have talked about it. But if he brings it up as a motivation to be drastic with this, then I'm, don't shoot the messenger. I'm telling you what he said. I'm trying to stay as close to this as I can. I'm not gonna, I don't want to say more, and I do not want to be unfaithful and say less than what Jesus has said. There are two Greek words for hell in the four Gospels. One is Hades. It's kind of a temporary, modified uh, version of hell. It's used in the Greek New Testament. Um, Sometimes it, it means a little more than the grave or the afterlife, but not always. The second word for hell is Gehenna. There's an old man in the old man in the Old Testament named Hinnom, and uh, he evidently sold a large piece of property outside Jerusalem. Uh, you could look him up. His name was Hinnom, and it's kind of a valley, a sunken section, and the Jerusalem, the city, used it for a garbage dump. And everybody took their garbage out there. The worm never died in Gehenna. Ge, G-E, or Je, means the land of. So Hinnom, the land of Hinnom, that they got from old man Hinnom back in the Old Testament. The little valley, it was the garbage dump. They didn't have garbage trucks, garbage pickups, so they took all their garbage out to the valley of Hinnom. And, and they would burn it. And the flames would never go out in the land of Hinnom. And if you look from a distance at the valley of Hinnom, it would look like a lake of fire. And that's the word he uses here. It's better to get rid of one member that's causing you to sin than your whole self go into Gehenna. And the reality is always worse than the symbol. And here Jesus uses the worst word he can use. And I trust Jesus with this teaching. He is the one that if I want to know about the afterlife, I'm going to trust Jesus to tell me. He's saying, don't take a chance on going to hell. It is horrible. It is beyond description. In Matthew 25, Jesus also said about hell, this is Matthew 25, verse 41. He said, at the final judgment, there will be those, he will say on, to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice two things there. One, it's eternal. Uh, that word is the same word used for eternal life. One's as long as the other. Two, it's prepared for the devil and his angels. God originally did not intend, he does, he's not intend, and he did not prepare hell for people. He prepared it for the devil as a final imprisonment, uh, a, an eternal federal prison house. And what he's saying here is this thing is so important, so vital. You need to take drastic action because you can end up there. At the place where it's the worst of the worst. It's not designed for you, it's designed for them, and that means it'll be worse on you. The worst prison in America is not Guantanamo Bay, but it's called the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado. It houses the worst of the worst. There has never been an escape since it opened in 1994. 
They put mass murderers, terrorists, pedophiles, serial killers, drug kingpins, they ship them all to Florence, Colorado. El Chapo is there. Ted Krachinsky, the Unabomber. Mohammed Salim, the founder of Al-Qaeda, is there. A former warden, Robert Hood, once said, this place is not designed for humanity. See, it's an illustration of hell. Can you imagine somebody who's just arrested for, maybe uh, he doesn't have his license or he's speeding and they arrest him and put him in the worst of the worst. Jesus is giving us a most solemn warning. If this is true, dear people, and I, I would ask you, if you challenge this, you go through the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Luke, and you find the passages that teach about hell from the lips of Jesus. Now, I want to end with this. I do not want to end on the topic, the awful topic of hell. I want to end by telling you there is grace, there is mercy, there is peace, there is power from God to deliver you and give you victory in this area. Amen. God can set you free. Hallelujah. Years ago, at the Mother Church, we had a sweet uh, singing group from Alabama come up and hold a youth conference at our church. Uh, More Abundant. Kevin was in that group. More Abundant. They came up and they held a, a youth conference on purity before marriage. We've got young people today married with children who were in that conference. And I attended that night when one of those men gave his testimony. It was riveting and powerful. And he talked about how he grew up in church but he began dating a young lady and they, they, got, they were sexually active and he lost his virginity and the, he was crushed with guilt and shame. And he didn't know what to do. Is there a future? Is there a hope? What is God, how does God see me now? And he, he turned us all to a verse in Jeremiah 31 verse 3 and 4. And put that verse up. (laughs) He said, I was reading this, I, God speaking to Israel. By the way, this Jeremiah 31 is when Israel was at her lowest point, ethically, spiritually. It's unbelievable. That was the worst moment in their history is Jeremiah 31. And here's what God said to him. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. You didn't continue your faithfulness to me, but I have continued my faithfulness to you. And again I will build you. You will be built, O virgin Israel. And he said, when I read that, I realized that God's calling us back to Himself, even with the worst we have done. 
In the lowest part of our life, he calls us to himself. Our unfaithfulness did not cause his unfaithfulness. He has been faithful to us. He has loved us through this, and he calls us to himself. And he, in forgiving us and cleansing us, he views us as virgins. Virgins. Like we'd never done anything wrong. And he said, God changed my life right there. I never forgot that. I never forgot it. If God can say that to a man in the Old Testament, if he can say that to his people Israel, what can he say to the church of Jesus Christ who has the blood atonement for her righteousness? What if, if God can pronounce virginity over an entire backslidden nation? What can he do by the blood of Christ in the New Testament? Glory to God. Glory to God. We're touching the invisible right here, my friends. We're touching the eternal. It is awesome. Would you bow your heads for prayer? I'm just going to ask you to pray quietly. And if you need to be drastic with this sin, just ask God to forgive you. Thank Him that He's loved you with an everlasting love and faithfulness. And ask Him to forgive you and in His sight to make you a virgin again. O oh, Heavenly Father, make us pure. As David prayed after Bathsheba, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Ushers, if you'll come and let's worship with our tithes and offerings.